Um, it's relatively straightforward. Um, and that's why, like, when you were asking me if it was a true story, I'm like, I don't know. I think so. No. Maybe. Yeah. No. I don't know. Because it, it's, it's relatively straightforward, but the implications of it can get kind of complex. So the sad truth is that most evil is done by people who never make up their minds to be or do good or evil. Um, and notice that she doesn't say that most good is done also by people who don't make up their minds to do good or evil. It's almost like this suggestion that, that goodness is something that you have to do, almost like force yourself to do by choice on most days. And if that's the case, that's a really scary prospect because that suggests that by nature we tend to do what's evil rather than what's good. Um, she's talking about a larger problem here when she writes this, but that's an implication that's there. And that kind of goes back to, if you remember, Socrates was saying that the, the form of goodness appears last of all. In other words, what it is to, to do the right thing, we have to learn how to do it. We have to be trained in, in, in doing it from a very early age. I mean, I think if any of you guys um, babysit little kids, you probably know this. Little kids are, are, are terrors. They have to be trained to do the right thing. And sometimes when they do do the right thing, it's almost like we're, we're relieved. We, we reward them in these extravagant ways because it's like, oh, good. Here, you, you didn't hit me with the truck. Good. Here's a, you know, here's a piece of candy or something. Because by nature, little kids will do the thing. They're, 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 they're little psychopaths. They're, they're narcissistic. They're, they're immature. They, they, they don't care about consequences. They, they um, have no conception of, of the future. If you take what a little kid is and you put them into an, into an adult body, that's exactly what a psychopath is. And so when they're little kids like that, they don't even understand when you're, when you're training them how to do the right thing. You almost have to do it by like, like the same way, it's not terrible, but the same way that you would train a dog. You have to appeal to things that are they're not associated at all with, the, with their reason. And so when you're telling them to, to do the right thing, they have to have a reason to do it aside from just the fact that it is the right thing. And then as we get older, we can start to adopt things and do things based off of principle. Like yesterday, in one of my classes, we were talking about, about um, the differences between mortals and immortals. And if you're immortal, what are the things that you want when you're immortal? And my list is very, very long. And then if I ask you what, what are the kinds of things that, that immortals want, the gods, it's a very short list. And, you know, they only came up with two things. And the two things they came up with, praise and power, are things that a, a, an immortal wants because an immortal should have them. In other words, it's just... If you're a god, you deserve these things. It's part of what it is to be a god. Other than that, they don't need anything or desire anything. And so it's very difficult to, um, to sway one. So anyway, um, one person mentioned loyalty on that list of what it is that mortals want. And that was like the one thing that was, that was completely disconnected from all of the other examples that the, that the class was giving. And that's because loyalty can be something that completely works against your self-interests. In other words, you know, we, we might think like, well, no, because if I'm loyal to you, you're loyal to me. Then that's not loyalty. That's, that's reciprocity. If you're loyal, regardless of how people re respond to you or behave to you, well, that's a character trait. And that's something that you have to actively decide. I'm going to be loyal to this, um, to this person no matter how they behave. That's a hard thing for a lot of us because we'll say, well, they don't deserve loyalty then. A lot of us don't deserve things like goodness and patience and, and kindness, but we still expect it. And if someone does show you kindness, even when you don't deserve it, that says way more about them than it does about, about you. But that's the thing. It's personal character development. It's ourselves having to make the decision to be a certain way. And so with loyalty, if you're loyal to people regardless of how they behave, that's a character trait that's important to you, and that's one of the things that defines you. But you have to make that decision every day, almost every hour in some cases, to, to be loyal. Uh, the same is true about, about goodness. You know, being good, you have to make up your mind. Of course, we have to know what goodness is, first of all. And we'll, you know, at some point hopefully we, we, we come to understand what that is. But once you understand what goodness is, it's so difficult to be good. You know, it's like you have to be honest all the time? Yes. Now, that doesn't mean, by the way, when, when people say, well, I'm just telling the truth, everything you, you don't have to, everything you say should be true, but you don't have to say everything that's true. I'll say that again, everything you say should be true, but you don't have to say everything that is true. Uh, if you're looking at someone and you think that their hair looks god-awful, and, and you say, how are you today? Oh my god, your hair looks terrible. You don't have to tell them that. 
It might be true, but you don't have to tell them that. If they ask you, how's my hair? Well, then what you say should be true. But you shouldn't blurt out truth every single time. People will do that and they'll say, well, I'm just being honest. And they'll think that they're doing something good. I don't know that they're convinced that they're doing something good. I think that they're trying to convince themselves that they're doing something good with that. But constantly you're going to be faced with these dilemmas. And the worst kind of dilemmas to be faced with are the ones that you could completely get away with. You know, if you can, if you can take, if you can steal this one thing and no one's going to know. You know, the, you know, who are you when no one's looking is, the, is what the, the phrase is. So it's a constant decision every day and I like almost every hour about doing good. And that takes a lot of effort. Instead, if we don't, if we don't, convin um, sorry, if we don't commit ourselves to doing good and we just kind of go with, with uh, the flow, I, I wonder almost what kind of evil we would do. I mean, we don't, I, actually, I, don't, I guess I don't have to wonder. We could think about it and we could kind of think about our, our own lives and the kinds of things that we do. And we think no one's looking, or no one's paying attention. We can think about our thoughts. So she's making a statement here that, that evil is kind of like the, the natural state of, of what people do. We harm each other, we kill each other. It's a very pessimistic view. And that's why I, I, I said I'm not sure if this is a true story. I shouldn't have said that before we started, but I did. Because it, it presents this view of humanity that we are constantly doing evil, and we have to like almost be forced <coughs> excuse me, to do what's good. But that's not necessarily the case, because while I talk about the kind of evil that you would do if you, if you could get away with it, it's also worth thinking about all of the good that you do without getting credit for it. And also similar, that people were ne are never going to see. And you have almost this like reason to, like almost like this draw to do the good when you don't have kind of an, an external reason to do it, if, if that makes sense. You know, we have this thing where we, we're, we, we kind of do the good even when we're not going to be rewarded for it. And it's, it's almost like you have to figure out, like, why is there, why is there this thing inside of us, that, 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 you know, the conscience, that makes us want to do the right thing? Especially once we understand what the right thing is. And there's really no good reason for it. You, know? you might say, well, there's a, you know, there, like evolutionarily, there's no reason for us to to, to be good people when no one's looking, but we do. You know, psychologically it helps us to stay consistent, to be one character, and not to divide our personalities up, and then that will cause, of course, inner, inner conflicts with our personality, but I don't know that mon many of us are, are, are thinking at that level, even unconsciously. And so, she said that we don't make up our minds to do good or evil, we just kind of go along with things. That's what she's getting at here. You know, we, we kind of go along with what authorities tell us, we go along with what people tell us, we go along with what society tells us. And, and again, I, I said it over again, I'm going to say it one more time. That isn't necessarily a terrible thing. Like, we, we, we use this kind of like, almost like it's a slur against people. Like, you're just doing what society tells you. Well, all, we all are, to a certain extent. The question isn't whether or not we're doing what we're told. The question is, are we doing the, the good things or the bad things that we're told? <clears throat> and then, of course, figuring those things out, what those things are. But um, I was just watching, you guys knew who, who um, I think I've mentioned him before, Josef Mengele. You guys know who he was? Angel of Death, they called him. He was a Nazi doctor who um, experimented on people at, at Auschwitz, especially twins. And um, interesting guy, because we, always we tend to think of, like, you know, we need to talk to smart people to find out what the right thing to do is. The guy had two PhDs, well, I guess two doctors, sorry. He had a PhD in philosophy and a, and a, and a medical degree, MD. The guy was incredibly well-educated, and yet he was experimenting on people while they were alive, cutting them open without anesthetic, um, you know, performing surgeries on them, injecting their hearts with chloroform. I was just uh, reading a thing last night that he killed 46 people in one night, in one night, by injecting chloroform into their hearts. You know, I mean, we think about like Ted Bundy and we're like, oh, what an evil bastard. He killed like 40 people. That dude killed 46 people in one night with 23 pairs of twins. Just by injecting chloroform and said, yep, they all died when you inject chloroform into their, into their hearts. Interesting. Next. Um, as I understand it, if I'm correct about that, as I've read, we've never received a single useful medical thing from this guy's, uh, I guess, research. It really wasn't research. It was sadism. Um, even when you look at like the Japanese who committed horrible atrocities against their prisoners, 
we did derive some useful things from them, medically, that we use today. As I understand it, we didn't receive anything useful from Mengele's experiments, not one single thing. Because it was stuff like, okay, so you have brown eyes. I wonder if I could give you green eyes by injecting dye into your eyeballs. And they would take a needle and just and inject it in there, no anesthetic, nothing, and then just sit there and wait for the results and see what happens. Um, there was one experiment where he, uh, he took twins and he wondered if he could conjoin them to make them into Siamese twins. And so he uh, sewed them together. He sewed veins together, you know, he cut open their veins, sewed their veins together. Um, their, their mother ended up killing them, uh, giving them a do an overdose, I think, of morphine or something like that because of the suffering they were in. They were just, you know, I guess, the, the, of course, the cuts were infected and there was just pus and they were in horrible pain. And it was just, I want to see if I can make, okay, I want to see if I can make enjoying twins. Um, I don't know if Mengele woke up every day and said, I'm going to do evil. I'm going to do evil. He probably woke up every day and said, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to do this one thing. And he just didn't believe there was such a thing as good and evil. He didn't, he didn't buy into that concept. He thought that there was just power and, and, and powerlessness. For him, there was no truth but power. And his son... Um, who uh, he ended up escaping, by the way. He died um, in Argentina. He had a stroke uh, while swimming, and he died. But he lived his whole life out. No, he never faced justice. He was never brought to trial because he was hiding. Um, kind of hiding in plain sight, it turns out, but hiding nonetheless, I suppose. But his son uh, went and, and met with him several times, and his son interviewed him, and he had a hard time believing that his dad had done those things, but his dad acknowledged that he had done those things. And he said that his dad's defense was, I don't know why everyone's so pissed about. I was just following orders. I had a job to do, and I was just doing my job. You know, and we look at that, and we're like, "What the hell? Like, you would do that if you were given orders?" I think that many of us would do some really horrible things if we were given orders to do them. And like you guys, I'm, some of you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with the shock experiments. Yeah. Um, in, in short, in, in real short, um, series of experiments done. I think it was in the '70s. Um, I'll have to look up the, the, the exact year of these things. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, researcher, um, I want to say it was at Stanford. I would, whenever I don't know where research was done, I always say Stanford because Stanford <laughs> did some really crazy shit, like in the 60s and 70s, psychologically, wasn't it? So, yeah, so once in a while, I'm actually right about that. Like the Stanford prison experiment, the shock experiment, the, the Milgram line experiments. Um, but anyway, it, all these were at Stanford. So whenever I hear about something terrible, I'm like, Stanford, that's where it was. And then I, I jokingly refer to this as the golden age of psychology because this is when there were no ethics or rules. You could just, they would just experiment on people without telling them. Um, anyway, they um, had a researcher um, just put an ad in the paper, brought in subjects, and the idea was we're going to test people's memories. So they would put you at a desk, and they would give you access to a button that would, and, and a dial, and they would tell you on the other side of the wall is a person who's taking a test. Um, when they get a wrong answer, we're going to have you shock them. We're going to test to see if this helps to improve their memory. Mm -hmm. And so they <clears throat> would sit there and ask these questions. Like, I don't know what the other questions were. Like, what's, you know, 9 times 9? 81. Okay, very good. What's 9 times 10? 55, whatever. Okay, give them a shock. And you mm -hmm. press the button, and the person would go, ow! You hear them on the other side of the wall. And then they would increase it, and increase it, and increase it. And they got a significant number of people who were willing to, to, to increase that dial, even though the person on the other side of the wall was begging, please stop, don't, oh God, please don't, please don't do it to them. Now, of course, there was nobody actually connected over there. They were just playing along with it. And they got several people to actually go all the way to the dial where they were told, if you administer this shock, the person's going to die. And people were still willing to do it for a $15 you know, payday, whatever it was back then. So it was a very small amount of money. So now you might think like, yeah, but it was, you know, it was only like whatever it was, like 10% of people. But it was also 10% with, with one guy standing next to him with a clipboard telling them, do this. Imagine how much worse they would be if it was a whole society, or if there were armed guards standing around, or if there was this intense social pressure. I think many of us are, are capable of doing way more than what we would indict ourselves to. But we would probably say the same thing. I was just doing what I was told. I'm just following orders. I think that we've gotten a real good look at ourselves, I think, in the past couple of years with stuff like that. I don't know that the Nazi guards woke up in the morning and said, you know what, 
we're Nazis. That's a bad thing. I think they probably woke up and just said we're we're you know part of a, a you know we're doing our duty. We're fighting a war. We're you know all kinds of explanations. Have any, have any of you guys ever seen that um, that skit? Are, uh, are we the baddies? Have you seen this before? I just saw it. I, guess, I think it's an older skit. But I just saw it not too long ago. And essentially, it's these two guys. It's, it's a British comedy show, and these two guys are dressed up in like full SS uniforms and everything, and they're discussing what they're going to do. And one of them looks at the other and goes, "Wait." Have you ever thought that maybe we're the baddies? Maybe we're the bad guys? He's like, what do you mean we're the bad guys? How could we possibly be the bad guys? I said, well, I mean, think about it. Like, you know, we wear skulls on our uniforms. They have like this little thing, you know, the, the, the SS skull. And then, and then you know, the lightning bolt's like, why, why, if we were the good guys, why would we be wearing skulls? And it's called the death head. Like, doesn't that sound weird? Like, we're wearing the death head? They're going through all of the things that they do. And you're, you're just asking, like, I don't know. It just feels like maybe we are the bad guys here. And you might look at that and go, well, like, everything that they did was this assertion of evil. But remember, the Nazis are living under a, under a philosophy that believes that there's no such thing as good and evil. They believe that it's only power. And there are a lot of people running around today. You'll hear people say this all the time, that there is no truth but power. And they're always about power, 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 because they don't believe that they, they think that the ends justify the means. I know people here who talk like that. It's frightening as hell, because if you then mention them Nazis, they would go, oh my god, those are horrible people. They don't realize that they're that they're existing under the exact same philosophy. They just disagree about the group. That's all it is. And yet, I don't know that they're, that they're evil people in the sense that they wake up... Um, I shouldn't say that. I don't think that they're evil people in the sense that they wake up in the morning and say, let's do some evil today. <laughs> you know, they wake up in the morning and they think that they're doing good. Or, they don't think of it in good, good and evil at all, necessarily. Yeah. I think that many of us would be capable of a lot more than we give ourselves credit for. Just because we don't make up the decision to be good or evil. If you don't make up the decision to do that, Hannah Arendt believes, you're going to naturally tend towards doing evil. And <clears throat> unfortunately, that's a, that's a hallmark of democracy. I'll leave with that, that controversial statement. Questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques?